Thank you for joining us for this episode. If you have any questions about this week's episode, or maybe a suggestion for future episodes you'd like us to explore, please contact us through our website at eqfit.org. For more information and inspiration, connect with us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube at EQFit. I've been waiting excitedly to do this episode for quite a while. There's a thing going on, call it a syndrome, call it a challenge, call it whatever you want. It's called continuous partial attention. I'm going to shorten that to CPA. Uh, No no negative toward our friends who are CPAs. This is a completely different thing. Um, But I want to talk about this. This is really important because I would bet that you see this somewhere in your life with someone. Continuous partial attention. You know, in today's hyper-connected world, we're constantly bombarded with notifications, with updates, and demands for our attention. I remember a study that came out a few years ago that said when office workers are in their normal daily routine, they get distracted about every three minutes. Think about that. Now, granted, we've moved into a bit of a different mode of business today where we have remote workers, we have office workers, we have hybrid, we have all of that. Well, think about remote workers today. What is the chance there's going to be an even higher level of distraction? Being at home, if you have kids, if there are demands to to carpool or to go to doctor's offices or whatever it happens to be. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with remote work, but this whole syndrome, so to speak, of continuous partial attention has just gotten worse over the last several years. So with all of our connectivity, uh, this continuous state of distraction is is really creating some challenges. So it's not like what a lot of people call multitasking. And I call that basically managing multiple priorities at the same time. You can't really multitask. It's, I mean, that would be doing several things at the same time. That's not what is accurate. I like more of a concept of managing multiple priorities at the same time because then your focus goes from one to the other because if you think about it if you try to multitask are we not falling into continuous partial attention a little bit of attention here a little bit of attention there this priority that priority are we not feeding that monster in that case so when we think about this The aim is to be efficient in managing multiple priorities. When we're looking at this thing called continuous partial attention or CPA, it's rooted in the emotional need to stay connected. Be informed, never miss out, and even in some cases just escape. Just get away from whatever it is that isn't energizing you. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with taking breaks, but we have to think about this continuous partial attention thing as as a challenge, because it is. It creates some significant potential for cost or loss. And I'm I'll talk about those here in just a minute. While we're multitasking, which is a good thing, you know, managing multiple priorities, you know, that's all about productivity. But CPA 
comes from a deeper emotional pull that drives us to be perpetually available and engaged, usually with everything except what truly matters. As you know, if you've been following my blog articles or my podcast episodes, I love to start with a story of some kind to illustrate the topic of our focus. I have so many stories for continuous partial attention. It's really difficult to select just one. So if you'll allow me to kind of combine some of these stories together. Over the years, I've worked with many different owners, partners, senior leaders of organizations, and of course, many other people as well throughout different levels of organizations. As you can imagine, these roles, these senior roles, carry a lot of responsibility, stress, and pressure. Now, some individuals have developed very productive habits to manage those challenges. Unfortunately, though, many have not. So take the case of an owner who's been experiencing stress for a long period of time. Every meeting sees this owner constantly checking their phone, not really paying full attention to what other people are saying. And then to be seen as participating, they jump in and they add their input. But others look at them as like, did you not listen? Did you not hear what we said? So there's this disconnect as if the person really hasn't been following along. And the truth is they haven't. Take the case of a COO who spends more time covering for his absences and his strange behavior than dealing with the root issues of the personal and professional challenges that this individual is having. So what does this person do? Well, when in the office, they spend hours at their desk surfing the internet, mostly on non-work-related stuff. And this last one, And this, I've seen so many times when this habit of continuous partial attention is reinforced over and over and over for whatever emotional need there is, I have seen it become very destructive and and create some seriously negative outcomes. So this last case of a senior leader who was so wrapped up in their desire to start their own business that they stole proprietary information from their employer and then began their own business while still collecting a paycheck from their current employer. That one didn't work out very well. And as you can imagine, most of these are not going to work out very well. These are serious problems many having very, very negative outcomes. The emotional drivers behind each one may be different, but the behavior displayed is very similar. So if we were to just talk about what do you look for in yourself and in other people, here's some behaviors to look for. Lack of focus on what's important, absences, behavior that seems out of the norm, loss of productivity, loss of profitability, poor leadership, subpar communication, and maybe most importantly, a negative impact on the culture. Now, I am not judging people or blaming people. It is a simple reality that some people deal with challenges and pressure and stress better than other people do. The, the question really comes down to why. Why do some people have the ability to focus fully, be fully present, communicate well, lead well, all of that, where others fall into this trap of continuous partial attention? And that's what we're going to discover today.
as we go deeper into this whole process of where does this continuous partial attention come from? At its core, continuous partial attention is driven by emotions. Whether it's the fear of missing out, which a lot of people call FOMO, F-O-M-O. Maybe it's anxiety about staying informed. Or maybe it's just a desire for instant gratification and happiness. The emotional drivers perpetuate the cycle of distraction. The moment we feel a notification buzz or we see an email pop up, there's a flood of emotional responses. Fear says, what if it's something important? Anxiety suggests, if I don't check now, I might forget. The desire for happiness tells us, maybe this is something that will bring some good news or some excitement. These emotions create habits that reinforce CPA. Checking your phone during a meeting, scrolling through social media while working on a project, or keeping half an eye on your inbox, that's all examples of continuous partial attention. And over time, this becomes a default behavior driven by deep-seated emotional triggers. I want to stop for just a minute and talk about this. There is a process that happens in habit formation where the habit that we form in that moment rewards us in some way. But the reality is that that habit may not reward us in the long run. Let's just take an example. I'm working on a really stressful project and there's so much going on. I'm having some issues at home, um, struggling with relationships. And I, I just, I feel this added stress, this, this increased emotional load that is getting heavier and heavier to carry. So I need to find a way to decompress a little bit. Okay. That's a good thing, right? It's okay to decompress. So what do I do? I, I say, okay, I'm just, I need 15 minutes. I'm just going to go check my Facebook. I'm going to go, uh, look at LinkedIn. I'm going to go, uh, just take a walk. I'm going to go do this. I'm going to go do that. Uh, I'm going to get away by escaping in a way that is comfortable and, and fun for me. Well, there's nothing wrong With that idea, there's nothing wrong with doing some of that. But when it becomes a habit that slides you into continuous partial attention, the project goes on, oh, last time I went and checked my social media, that helped me feel better. Now I'm stressed again, so I'm going to do it again. All of a sudden, that the cue the emotion, the trigger that is drawing you toward practicing that habit more and more just reinforces that habit. And over the long run, that could be very detrimental. So uh, there's a lot of science behind this that I I don't really want to spend the time on or go too deep in. but, But bottom line, Your emotional triggers, what's happening with your emotions are driving this need. And the way that you have created a reward system, relieving the stress, again, not a bad thing, but when it becomes a detriment to your focus, to your work, to getting things done, um, and even to your livelihood for that matter, then it becomes a problem then we've fallen into this continuous partial attention mode. And maybe that's situational. Maybe it only happens when you have a big major project. But isn't that the time you need your most uh, accurate levels of focus, your, your best self to show up? 
So I, that's what I want you to understand around what's going on because there is a solution to all of this. There's a remedy for all of this that we're going to talk about. But if you don't understand your patterns and your habits and where they're coming from, it isn't necessarily that something you do is a bad thing the first time you do it. But it's just like, hey, when I feel down, I want to eat ice cream. Okay, I don't want to get any nasty emails about people not not liking me talking about eating ice cream when they're down. But, but here's the deal. If you feel down 10 times a day and you're eating ice cream 10 times a day, we all know that's not good for you. That's not healthy. So that's where we need to start to look at our choices and our habits and our reward systems. In a simple way to look at this, is what I'm doing now helpful for now or could it become a counterproductive habit that I don't want to reinforce in the long run? And I guarantee you that we all have areas in our life where we need to ask that question. So as I said, these emotions create those habits and then we reinforce that continuous partial attention. Um, And we do it through a variety of different means. So allowing this to take root has several different detriments. Allowing this to take root has several different detrimental effects, not only productivity, but also on personal well-being. I mean, if you think about it, the less that we achieve, the less we have to celebrate, which could drive the cycle of continuous partial attention because we're not getting the reward system we want out of achievement So we turn to something else and it starts to make a lot of sense when you think about, you know, people who are highly productive and very successful and others who are not. A big difference is how much can they focus and bring that focus to bear to achieve the things that they want to achieve. And the enemy of focus is continuous partial attention. What are some of these things we need to be aware of? What are the potential negative downside of this continuous partial attention? Well, the first, as we talked about, is reduced productivity. Studies show that switching between tasks or being distracted can reduce productivity by up to 40%. I'm not saying you've got three things at work today you have to do. And so you're switching between those and that reduces your productivity by 40%. No, it's all of those other little distractions that continuous partial attention because you're turning to your phone to get some feedback or you're constantly checking your email. It could be work-related. It could be that you are so habitually addicted to checking your email every two minutes, that's a horrible place to be, especially now. Most of the people that I work with get an average between 200 and 300 emails a day. Think about that a minute. How can you possibly focus and and really get the work done you need to when all of of those emails are just flooding you all of the time. And you've built up this, these emotional drivers around needing to check those to make sure you're not missing anything important. So reduced productivity is definitely one that, that we want to think about. Uh, Here's another one that you may or may not even be aware of. It can reduce your higher cognitive functions which means shallow thinking. Continuous partial attention leads to more shallow cognitive processing. Instead of diving deeply into tasks and problem solving, we tend to skim the surface, 
often missing critical details and failing to think creatively or strategically. That's a big deal, especially in your role at work where you are trying to influence other people. You're trying to solve problems. You may be a leader of people. Well, let me put it this way. You are a leader of people, whether you have a authoritarian leadership role or whether you're just leading people through the normal process of your daily activities. So the next one, what is the next big downside to allowing this continuous partial attention to happen? It's increased stress and anxiety. The constant ping of notifications keeps us in a heightened sense of a, almost a state of alert. You know, oh my gosh, when's the next one going to drop? What's going to happen next? It contributes to chronic stress and anxiety. We're never fully relaxed because we're always anticipating the next interruption. That's something that I think is very important to think about. And there are, there are physical things we can do by setting boundaries that will help us. But as we're going to talk about here in a minute, unless you remove the emotional drivers of some of this behavior, it's not going to last. You're not going to get the transformation that you want. Uh, poor relationships. Here's another one. Continuous partial attention can negatively impact interpersonal relationships. When we only give partial attention in our conversations or interactions, it signals to other people we're not fully present. And basically, we don't care that much. Uh, That can erode trust and connection. And it does. I've seen it happen. I have seen leaders who were really, really good leaders just almost fall off completely and become very ineffective because of this thing called continuous partial attention. And then the last one to talk about is mental and emotional exhaustion. Constantly switching attention between things drains cognitive resources, leading to mental fatigue, This fatigue and then perpetuate this cycle of distraction. Because when you're fatigued, you're going to go to something that rewards you. But then the problem with that is the reward becomes less and less. So you need more and more of it. That's a problem. That it's it's almost like an addiction in some ways, because you're looking to to fulfill a need or a desire. And the more of it that you get, a lot of times, the less potent it becomes. So now let's talk about how do we move forward from here? Because I don't want to leave you in a place where, great, Steve, thanks a lot. Now I feel really encouraged. No, there is a real remedy for this. And it's something that can be put in place fairly easily. Breaking free from continuous partial attention requires more than just turning off your notifications or setting boundaries with technology. The key to lasting change lies in addressing the emotional drivers behind the behavior and the habits that have been created and creating new habits that prioritize focus and prioritize presence. Now, here's how emotional intelligence and habit transformation, which draws from tools like emotional intelligence assessments and the habit story assessment, here's how that kind of information can empower us and give us the fuel needed to make the changes. Number one, it starts with self-awareness identifying those emotional triggers. The first step in overcoming CPA is developing self-awareness and even enhancing it. Emotional intelligence begins with understanding the emotions that drive behavior. Why do you feel compelled 
to check your phone every few minutes? What emotional needs are being fulfilled by consistent and constant connection like that? Now, using tools like EQ assessments um, and habit story assessment that I've talked about in the past, people can identify the root causes of their CPA behavior. And that's critical. If you don't get to the root cause, you're never going to get the outcomes that you really want. You're, you're never going to be able to get to your best self if you don't have that level of self-awareness. And it comes through good validated assessments and measures that are going to help you enhance your self-awareness. And then this awareness allows for a deeper understanding of the fear, the anxiety, the desire, whatever it is that is triggering the distractions that you're experiencing. So what can we put in place? What's an actionable practice? Start with a daily reflection or even a journaling habit. Track instances where you catch yourself distracted. And then ask yourself this. What emotion was I feeling when I reached for my device? Over time, patterns will emerge that reveal your emotional triggers. And it's important to write those down somewhere. Maybe you can remember those, but I know with everything going on in my life, I keep that kind of of journal when I want to change something and and make something uh, better. And frankly, I, I coach people to do the same thing. What's the second thing we can do to, to remedy this continuous partial attention? Well, it's self-regulation. It's creating new habits. Once the emotional drivers are identified, the next step is self-regulation. Learning to manage those emotions or navigate those emotions and create new, healthier habits. This involves reprogramming the brain's default response to distractions by consciously choosing actions that foster better focus and reduce distraction. And I can tell you right now, there is hard data that says 43% of our daily actions are habitually driven basically without thought. Think about that. That comes close to 50% of your daily actions are driven simply by your habits. But if we have the self-awareness to know what those are and make a decision about whether we want to keep those or change those and then practice self-regulation, we have the opportunity for transformation. We have the opportunity to become better focused, more successful, have a more satisfied life wherever we are. So using something like the habit story assessment, people can identify both their productive and their counterproductive habits and the habit loops that happen. uh, And then they can design new ones. They can change. And this isn't as hard as it sounds. Uh, When I work with people on the habit story assessment and their findings, I just did a a two-hour coaching session with someone who took it for the first time this week, and they were absolutely shocked at how much it resonated with them and how much they could wrap their brain around after having that insight and what they can do with that information. Um, So using something like that, instead of reacting to every notification with anxiety, you could set designated times for checking your emails and messages. And I highly recommend that. That's a great practice. Replace the habit of constantly checking with intentional focus on a single task for a set period of time. So, for instance, 25 minutes on something. Then go take five minutes and and check your device or or do something else. But break 
the habit that is driven by the emotional trigger? What is the practices we can put in place for self-regulating? Well, first, digital minimalization. What is that? Limit your device usage by setting clear boundaries. For instance, create focus zones during the day when you can turn off all your notifications, allowing yourself to engage in deep, uninterrupted work. Okay, for those of you that are saying, my boss isn't going to like it if I don't respond to them immediately. All you have to do is set good expectations with your boss. Sit down, have a conversation that says, Hey, I find myself becoming more and more distracted with all of the demands. I know that I want to be as productive as I can be, so I'm going to have set times when I respond to things during the day. It isn't that it isn't important. It isn't that that what we're doing, um, you know, that I'm not paying attention to it. I'm actually focusing better on the things that need to be done. And I think that conversation will be received fairly well. So think about that. You know, I understand there are... There are supervisors, there are bosses, there are owners, there are leaders who want immediate responses, but that's their habit. And frankly, feel free to to point them toward this episode because if that's where they are, where they feel like they always have to have immediate responses, they probably have some CPA going on for themselves and they're probably not as productive as they can be. And I'll be happy to talk to them. Feel free to point them my direction. What else can we do as far as self-regulating? Be mindful about what's going on. Before switching tasks or checking your device, take a breath and ask yourself, is this necessary right now? I think that's a fair way to look at that. Now, That moment of mindfulness that we just talked about helps to break the automatic habit of distraction. So we're putting in a choice point where you're asking that question and then you make a choice. Maybe you make a choice not to go to your device. Maybe you make a choice to go to your device. That's okay, but you're making an intentional choice You're not allowing the habit to make the choice for you. The third thing, intrinsic motivation, focusing on what truly matters. Deep down, what really truly matters? What are real priorities here? Intrinsic motivation, which is the internal drive to achieve goals without the external rewards taken into account, that's a crucial component of emotional intelligence. To combat continuous partial attention, it's important to reconnect with the intrinsic motivators behind your work and your goals. You know, what, is, what are your values? What are your beliefs? What are the things that intrinsically motivate you? And it's important to reconnect with those. What's truly important to you? What outcomes are you working toward? How does continuous distraction derail those efforts? And if you start to have more of that kind of a thought process, I think it's going to help you be more intentional with your choices. Aligning your actions with your intrinsic motivation helps you stay focused on meaningful tasks and prioritize what matters most rather than succumbing to every distraction that comes along. How can we put that into practice? Set intentions. At the start of each day, set three intentions or goals that align with your larger mission or values. This keeps your focus on what truly matters, helping you resist distractions that don't contribute to your outcomes. Now, the fourth thing that can help remedy this continuous partial attention is building new social skills. 
engaging more meaningfully, engaging more meaningfully with people. I like to call that being fully present in the moment. If you find yourself in a conversation where your mind is drifting or you're checking your phone or something like that, then you are not fully present in the moment. You would be amazed at how much you can get done if you practice being fully present in the moment. CPA often extends into our social interactions as well, where we only give partial attention to other people. Strengthening emotional intelligence skills by developing better social skills, which are a part of emotional intelligence, uh, such as active listening and empathy, that helps people engage more fully in their relationships. This not only improves personal connections, but also trains the brain to be fully present both in work and in life. How can we put that into practice? Active listening. In every conversation, practice active listening by fully focusing on the speaker without distractions and without letting your mind drift. This strengthens your attention muscles and it it really helps you to engage more deeply with people uh, and, and to get things accomplished that you want to accomplish. And the last thing that I'll talk about here is emotional habits. So practicing gratitude, practicing focus. Finally, when we can replace the habit of continuous partial attention That allows us to become our best self. It requires the development of new emotional habits, such as gratitude and focus. Fostering a mindset of gratitude in ourselves shifts attention from what's happening elsewhere to the present moment. Practicing focus in small, deliberate ways can help retrain our brains to resist distraction. How can we put that into practice? Start a gratitude journal. Spend five minutes at the end of every day reflecting on what you're grateful for. This practice helps to train the brain to focus on the present and appreciate it. This may sound kind of surface level and kind of warm and fuzzy and maybe not all that important. There is deep psychology going on here. And there is deep neuroscience going on here. If we can retrain our brains to focus on the present, what we're thankful for, what we've been able to accomplish, rather than always looking for the next update or the next notification or whatever it happens to be, we are going to become much stronger in our ability to avoid distractions, especially those that become a habit that take away from our future. I mean, honestly, that's what's going on here. Let me kind of tie this together. Continuous partial attention is a modern day challenge that can lead to stress, reduced productivity, and shallow thinking. None of those are good for you. The emotional drivers behind CPA, such as fear, anxiety, and the desire for happiness or just to escape, create habits that are difficult to break. However, using emotional intelligence and habit transformation, individuals can identify the root causes of their distractions and they can develop healthier, more focused habits. By building self-awareness, practicing self-regulation, aligning with intrinsic motivators, people can break free from this cycle of distraction and they can enhance their productivity and their well-being. With intentional effort, practical strategies, and the help of assessments like the habit story, it's possible to replace continuous partial attention with meaningful focus and with being fully present. That's going to lead to more successful outcomes, both personally and professionally. 
And isn't that what we all want? Greater success in life and work. Thank you for joining us for this episode. If you have any questions about this week's episode or maybe a suggestion for future episodes you'd like us to explore, please contact us through our website at eqfit.org. For more information and inspiration, connect with us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube at EQFit.